Assalamualaikum and welcome to the Harborn Islamic Study Circle, Hisk Seera Session 128. <coughs> and inshallah we'll do the uh, second part of uh, the story of Banu Quraitha uh, today. Uh, so quickly recapping uh, last week's, uh, the previous session on uh, the first part of Banu Quraitha, which happened immediately after the cessation of hostilities of the um, Battle of the Ditch, Battle of the Trench, or the Battle of the Confederacy, the Allied Forces, um, um, also known as uh, Khandak or Ahzab. Um, so in terms of um, as soon as the, uh, the morning after the end of the battle, uh, the Prophet uh, made sure that all the uh, Allied uh, armies had uh, left and then he returned home after the battle. And as he is uh, taking off his armor, uh, Angel uh, Gabriel Jibril comes to him and says, you know, why are you taking your um, armor off? Um, and uh, uh, you need to sort out uh, the problem over there, pointing to Banu Koreva uh, and says, look, you know, we've not, uh, I've brought a fresh battalion of angels uh, with me. And so uh, Jibril set off towards Banu Quraitha and instructed the Prophet ﷺ that Allah has commanded him uh, to uh, to uh, fight uh, Banu uh, Quraitha. And so Jibril took on the form of uh, one of the most handsome people of Medina called uh, Dihya al Qalbi. And then the Prophet ﷺ really famously instructs the Muslims, and uh, this is a really well known, inshallah, would we'll probably do, do, deal with it either at the end of this week or certainly next week might do a, a whole session on it. The Prophet uh, instructs the Muslims, uh, do not pray Asr until you reach Banu Quraitha. Uh, and so um, he's putting his armor back on, getting ready, and then, uh, and then uh, setting out. He dispatches uh, Ali to uh, plant the flag in front of Banu Quraitha just to say, we mean business. Um, and then uh, they start the siege of uh, Banu Quraitha, which in total lasted for about 25 days. Uh, so we'll, we'll be getting towards the end of it uh, now. So 25 days on top of the sort of 20, 25, you know, uh, plus days of the uh, siege of the Battle of the Trench. Um, and then towards the end of the, uh, sorry, towards the end of the siege, when Banu Quraitha know the game is up, uh, and that there's no way out. Uh, they decide uh, to uh, present three options. Uh, so first of all, uh, the chief of Banu Quraitha, Kar bin Asad, he gives three options to the tribe of Banu Quraitha, uh, who are a Jewish tribe. And he says, look, become Muslim and live. You know, uh, you know we, we'll keep our property, we'll keep our wealth, we'll keep everything just change from uh, the Jewish religion to the uh, uh, become Muslim. And verily, we know this is the prophet that's been prophesied. And they all said no. <coughs> okay, fine. Option two. Well, in that case, why don't we kill our own families, women and children, and then we fight to the death. And then if we win, we marry again, start families. And if we lose, well, then what have we lost? Uh, and again, uh, the, uh, the, the tribe rejected that option. Then the third option was, well, let's launch a a surprise counterattack, and the only way we're going to surprise them because their forces are getting stronger day by day. The only way we're going to surprise them is to attack when they least expect, which is on the day of the Sabbath. Uh, and then again, they rejected fighting on the day of the Sabbath. So uh, they rejected all uh, options. Uh, so then they tried to negotiate with Prophet and and then they said, "Look, give us what you gave to the other tribes. Give us safe passage with all our goods." So trying it on, Prophet says, "No, unconditional surrender." Uh, and then uh, the, the the delegation says, "Okay, fine. Uh, give us safe passage with our lives only, but you can keep all our goods and keep our houses." And Prophet says, "No," insists on unconditional uh, surrender. Uh, then Banu Quraitha, uh, the, 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 the leadership and the elite, they request an audience with their friend Abu Lubaba, uh, who was very close to them in the days of Jahliya. Uh, and uh, Abu Lubaba, uh, he, uh, he gets uh, sent for, the Prophet sends him, and he goes to 
the uh, the tribe of Nicoreda and they're having a chit chat and they're wailing and they're basically saying, look, what's going to be what's going to be our fate? Uh, what should we do? And he, he said, look, you should consent and you should surrender unconditionally. You have no choice. And they said, well, what's going to happen to us? And then he made a gesture that you're likely going to be killed. Um, he didn't know for sure. This was just you know his interpretation, which is what he felt, uh, because the Muslim hadn't actually said what was going to happen. Uh, and then, as soon as he realised that, he know, he he recognised uh, in himself that he uh, betrayed his trust to the Prophet So he rushed back, avoided the Muslims, went back to uh, Masjid the Nabwi, and tied himself to a pillar. Says, "I'm not going to leave this spot until Allah forgives me." Uh, and that's known as the the, the pillar of Toba of repentance in uh, Masjid the Nabwi, which is still there, Alhamdulillah. Uh, and then later on, it, it took about six days. Uh, after the end uh, of the uh, hostilities, uh, the verse came and, and Allah had forgiven him. And uh, Prophet Hassan had said prior to Allah, if only he'd come to me, I would have prayed to Allah to forgive him. But anyway, that's uh, the story of uh, Abu Lubaba. Uh, then, uh, with all those things exhausted, um, the Banu Qurayda, they just had to surrender. They had no choice. Uh, stocks were uh, running low. They realised there were no help was coming from them, coming to them from Banunir or from the old Banu Qurayda, uh, Banu Qainuka, uh, nor from the Quraysh or Hasafan or anyone else. They're on their own. So, uh, uh, so then uh, they unconditionally surrender, uh, and uh, the. Uh, the night before they surrender, one uh, we know of at least one person who manages to escape um, and uh, in good faith, uh, unharmed. This is a chap uh, came out of Banu Qurayda. He had vocally disapproved of the actions of Banu Qurayda, uh, and he didn't. Uh, he made it known that he was not in agreement with their actions of. Um, uh, tearing up the treaty and being disloyal to the Prophet ﷺ. And he came out and he met Muhammad bin, uh, bin Maslama who was guarding him and said, look, let me go. And then uh, Muhammad bin Maslama said, okay, fine. And then the Prophet ﷺ didn't censure him for that. Uh, and uh, then as part of the negotiations, when they uh, finally surrendered, the process, uh, all of the Aus, uh, the tribe of the house, they surrounded the Prophet and said, look, you, you know, uh, be gentle with them. They are uh, our, our allies. Uh, treat them, you know, like you treated the other tribes. You know, so for example, when the chief of the Khazraj, uh, 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 Ibn Sulayl, you know, when, when he was given the, 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 the tribe, he, he let them go with, with their goods. And they said, look, you know, you know, where be, you know, uh, why can't they have fate like that? And so the Prophet, Sallam, you know, he's surrounded by all these people. They're making, you know, uh, these um, suggestions to him. And so the Prophet says, okay, fine, will you be happy if one of your own people, your own tribes people, makes the final judgment? And they said, yeah, of course. And so then he goes, well, I choose for you, Saad ibn Mu'adh, who is their chief. And they're really happy. That it's uh, that it's uh, Saad. Um, you obviously, you know, their relationship, Saad's and the Banu uh, Qurayda uh, goes back a long way. Uh, so they they had some hope that you know uh, that, that this would be a good judgment uh, in, in their in their material eyes, a good judgment or an equivalent to what's happened to the other ones. So they 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 some of the people that are in that. They're in that uh, hope. Uh, at this point in time, Saad bin Mu'ad, he was, as we mentioned before, fatally wounded. So he had an arrow who, uh, that struck him uh, and sev partly severed one of his arteries. He's lost a lot of blood. Um, and uh, he recognizes that this might be the uh, his, uh, his end. Uh, and he's being nursed by Rufayda in sort of a makeshift uh, field hospital tent in Masjid al Nabwi. So uh, the Prophet sends word that he's going to make the judgment. And so obviously some of the the, um, the Aus, they rush over to him and they, they surround him as well. And that's where we left off last week. So uh, carrying on with that. 
uh, as I said, uh, Saab, uh, he's been bleeding for at least 25 days, you know, um, three and a half weeks. Um, if he'd sustained his uh, injury sort of midpoint, uh, if he'd sustained his injury right at the end of the Battle of the Ditch, then it's at least 25 days. If he'd sustained his injury prior to that, then obviously he's been injured for longer than 25 uh, days. But, you know, um, uh, you know he's, he's, he's in a poor and critical uh, state. Um, so they uh, they put him on a uh, on a mule and and and, and, and took him to Bonukoleda from the, his uh, field uh, hospital his his tent, uh, whether he was sat on the 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 mule or whether they sort of crafted like you know, uh, a a, um, a makeshift uh, bed uh, uh, to drag along to to get to Bonukoleda it, it's not uh, clear, uh, but anyway he arrives in in uh, uh, Bonukoleda. All the while, the house are surrounding him and saying, "Look, you've got to be merciful. You know, remember this, remember that. Look, look, look what they did. How you know how how far back our uh, ties go." So Sans, you know, he's hearing this from some of his own tribes people. So then he blurts out, so people can hear him. Basically, look, like, don't hassle me. You know, he knows he's been you know get, get given this uh, 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 choice to uh, to make judgment. So he said, don't hassle me. And he says loudly, now is the time of Sa'ad not to care about his people, but only Allah and his messenger. So as soon as he says that, basically, stop harassing me. This is the end of my days. My judgment is one that's not going to, that I'm not making this judgment to please you. I'm making this judgment in a way that I would think would please Allah and his messenger. So some of the, 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 the wiser people immediately understood that look, he's saying, I'm going to be sincere to Allah, right? That means that basically it's not looking good for Banu Quraitha, given what they've done. You know, there can only be one uh, true uh, outcome, decision. So, you know, and again, this is what Abu Lubaba, he knew that the only decision, that the only right decision for the treachery uh, and the sort of uh, the, the warfare, the double crossing, the scheming that Banu Kureva had done, it, it can only mean one thing. I mean, this is more severe than what uh, Banu Qaynuka uh, did, you know, with the marketplace. Uh, and Banu Nadir with the assassination attempt. I mean, this was all out, you know, mutiny. You know, uh, allying yourself with the army, uh, the enemy army, uh, expressly against the terms of the agreement, uh, and 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 uh, really putting the 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 uh, the whole community of Muslims at risk. Right. So they were the fifth colonists. And basically, had they carried out their uh, allegiance with the allied tribes, they would have, you know, uh, completely killed all the Muslims. I mean, 10,000 strong plus Banu Quraitha, uh, you know, seven, 800 fighting strong people uh, from inside. And it was potentially a bloodbath uh, for uh, the Muslims. And this was the, this was the calculus. So they knew in, in that situation, double-crossing, scheming, there is only one fair judgment. But anyway, uh, Saad, he's, uh, he's brought it in, 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 you know, in, in front where the, the, the headquarters are, where the Prophet Salam is, is camped. And the Prophet Salam, uh, and, and this is the only time it's recorded where he instructs the people to stand up for someone. I mean, he didn't even, uh, you know, instruct people to stand up for him when he enters the room, right? Uh, and, and you know, he he said previously that you know you you shouldn't stand up for people, uh, and uh, the way that's interpreted is people of respect shouldn't expect when they enter a room or into the masjid that everyone stands up for them, right? The expectation is you remain seated, but if you want to stand up, that's fine. So long as you don't expect people to stand up for you, okay? If it's uh, if if you stand up to greet someone as a sign of respect, well, that's fine. 
But if if you enter and you expect everyone to stand up for you, then that's not allowed. That's uh, that's pride and arrogance. Uh, but on this one occasion, Prophet says, "Stand up and greet your leader." Right, uh, and uh, so then you know the people obviously they stood up and you know uh, greeted uh, uh, Saad. Uh, as I say, this is this is an exception. Uh, I mean, the Prophet some he, he himself you know stood up to greet some people, right? Uh, but again, it wasn't uh, a, a a habit. And again, if if or respected people come in, then you're allowed to do it so long as you don't feel it's a religious obligation or you make a habit out of it. So <clears throat> suppose there's some he's setting the scene for everyone. So they're in the headquarters. They've got the elite. They've got the chiefs there. And Prophet says to uh, Saad, "Your people have accepted you as the judge for these people, from the Quraysh, right?" Um, and uh, there's no Banu Quraysh there. Their delegations inside. They are anxiously awaiting their fate, right? Uh, the Muhajir. You know, uh, obviously some of the elite Muhajir will be there, uh, you know, uh, with the Prophet Sallam. But generally the, the, the Muhajir and the Khazraj, they're not involved in, in this decision making. They're not in part, part of the the, uh, the entourage around at Saad, uh, the, in, in, in uh, GHQ. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and, uh, and again, it makes sense because the, the Khazraj, they, they were allied uh, to the other tribes that have been expelled, and, and they've got their own animosity uh, going historically back uh, against Banu Quraidah, so they may not be fair in their judgment, so they're staying out of it. Um, so uh, Saad uh, said uh, that, uh, said to, to his own people, and he's still the, uh, one of their chiefs, I, I call you to Allah and tell you to uh, make a promise to Allah that you will listen and obey me in whatever verdict I give, right? So they've already agreed it, but he wants he he wants this to be reiterated from their own mouths in front of him, right? So there's no dispute. So it says, you know, I, I, I call you to Allah, make a promise that whatever my verdict, you will listen and you will obey. And they said, yes, of course, it's you. Uh, so he turned uh, towards the Prophet ﷺ, where the Prophet ﷺ was sat, uh, he didn't make eye contact with the Prophet he lowered his head uh, and and he goes uh, uh, as well as you uh, Rasulullah you know will you be happy with my verdict and he sort of gestures in that direction but he doesn't you know that it's you know it could be seen as you know uh, inappropriate impudent you know he's asking the message of Allah are you going to be happy with, with, with what I say and respect you know uh, and being being put in this unique position by the Prophet he, you know, again, he, he just wants everything to be above board. So look, are you going to be happy with whatever I say? And the Prophet uh, uh, says, of course, uh, that's what's been uh, agreed. So then once he's got uh, the verbal uh, assurance that everyone in, 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 in the uh, audience uh, will accept his judgment, then he goes, <clears throat> fine. My judgment is that uh, they, their, their men, should be executed, and their property, and their women, and their children taken uh, as captives, oh, sorry, their property distributed, and their women and children to be taken as captive, right? So, the, the harshest, the most severe judgment that the Sharia allows is uh, is this. And again, he, you know, Saad knows this because, you know, they've been to battles before. They know, he knows what the, the extent of what is allowable in the Sharia is. So it's to kill the, the fighting men, uh, take the women and children as captives, and distribute the, uh, the spoils. Uh, all their, their their goods. When he said that, then the Prophet and that's the judgment, that's the hukum. Uh, then the Prophet says, Wallahi, this is the judgment of Allah from above the seven heavens. You know, basically saying, this is what Allah would have wanted. And again, if we go back to the Battle of Badr, 
where the Prophet had you had know, prisoners of war. Uh, and he made the judgment that he took advice uh, and he made the judgment that they should ransom them. And then Allah says, look, you know, Allah chastised him for that. Actually, this was the first time that the Haq and the Batil came face to face. You should have executed them. And again, this is what uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab uh, uh, advised. This was his counsel. Uh, but the Prophet took Abu Bakr's uh, counsel uh, on this. So, you know, so there is that, there is precedence uh, there. Uh, and so, <clears throat> whereas, the, you know, the, there is a spectrum of allowable judgment, the one that pleases Allah the most was this. And again, this goes back to this issue of ikhtilaf, difference of opinion, or, or, or the correct judgment when it comes to how we uh, live our life. And again, we'll revisit this, inshallah, when we talk about the, the 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 issue of do not pray asa until you get to Banu Quraida. Uh, and this is again a demonstration of the fact that it is perfectly allowable to have a a suite of opinions in Islam. But actually there's only one true opinion that is the closest to what Allah wants us to do. Okay? In those matters where there is uh, allowable differences. Okay, we'll talk about that in more detail later on because it's a really important point, and I don't want to uh, distract from the story. Uh, well, let's finish the story, and then we'll come back onto that. But anyway, his verdict was executing uh, the men, uh, women, and children as captives, and dis uh, uh, distribution of the uh, their property. Uh, and the Prophet says this is what Allah uh, would have wanted. So then. Uh, the news was conveyed to Banu Quraida and they, they knew this was uh, uh, going to happen but they were hoping against hope that uh, they would uh, there would be another verdict so <coughs> so then uh, trenches were, were were dug outside uh, Banu uh, Quraida the males were uh, tied up and they were taken in uh, batches and, and, and executed um, sounds a bit harsh but you know again this is even the law of their own books so this is this is actually the same hukam that the Banu Quraida would have followed uh, it's in the Torah it's in Deuteronomy and I'll come on to that in a second uh, uh, and uh, one of the uh, the incidents is that there was a um, a young boy at the time he you know he narrates later on that I was spared because I didn't have any hair. So again, the way that they would, I mean, men, you can see it was men, but the, those who were on the cusp of manhood, <coughs> the way that they differentiated was the the, the, the growth of, you know, uh, your, your male hair. Uh, so obviously if, if, if it was obvious that they were having, you know, uh, your um, male pattern uh, hair growth, then they would, and again, the, the scholars have, have, have classified it in, in different categories. Uh, but when it's obvious, then you're in the category to, of men, and uh, you, you, uh, they were siphoned off for um, execution. Whereas those who hadn't reached that stage of, uh, of puberty, they uh, uh, were spared, and they would go with the, the women and uh, children. And there's a, a couple of stories around the execution where, for example, and, and this is really instructive, Huyay bin Akhtar, and we've talked about him a lot. Uh, he was uh, the chap that, uh, when the Prophet first came in to Quba, after, from the migration from the Hijra, uh, settled in Quba, started building the mosque, High-level delegations of uh, the, the the Jews uh, came, uh, and uh, they they had audience with him to you know because he's the prophet, and and some high-ranking rabbis they became Muslim. Uh, Huye again, chief of uh, uh, Banu Nadir, he came and he met uh, the Prophet Sallam, and he came you know and then he came back. To his home that that evening, and then we've got the story here where uh, <coughs> his daughter Sophia, she's playing around, and then she 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 remembers this clearly. She's a young girl, and Huye is talking uh, with uh, Sophia's uncle, 
uh, and they ignore Sophia. So this is something, wow, it's never happened to me before. They love me and they, they always play with me. And she overheard the conversation and, and basically the conversation was, uh, the, uh, the, the uncle said to Hoye, is he the prophet? And he goes, yeah, he is the prophet. Most definitely the, he is the prophet that's been prophesied in our books. So the uncle goes, well, how are you going to react to that then? If he's the prophet, we're expecting him. What's your reaction? And then Hoye goes, I will be his enemy till my last day. And he was true to his word. And, and, and the reason, knowing that he's the prophet, as being prophesied by Allah, the thing that rankled him was this issue of tribalism, of nationalism. He, Muhammad is an Arab. They are Jews. They are superior. Right? Their tribe is... Uh, should be superior why has Allah chosen someone from a different tribe and nation to be the last prophet even though it's written in their books he just couldn't get over that 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 nationalism uh, and so he said I'm gonna be his avowed enemy till the end uh, and he's the one Hoye, who was scheming you know uh, running backwards and forth from uh, you know uh, Banu Nadir uh, to Banu uh, Quraytha, uh, to uh, the, um, the Quraysh, uh, you know, and, and forming these alliances. Uh, and so, uh, he, he marches out in all his pomp and arrogance, right? Uh, and uh, he's wrapped himself up in his finest uh, red garment, you know, and again, it's just really... I mean, this is no words to describe, uh, you know, how how pomp and uh, arrogant this whole drama is. He's ta being taken to his death. He knows that Rasulullah is the, the, the prophet that's been prophesied uh, and all the actions he's done. And he knows that if he says the Shahada, all will be forgiven. But even at that stage, you know, he's too arrogant to uh, to to change, right? Uh, and uh, and then he's you know he and he, he wraps up. It, it said that he, he wrapped his finest cloak around him and then he tied strings around it so that even after he's died, no one takes his his most prized garment off his uh, dead body. So he passes by the Prophet Salam, and and he again in just complete arrogance. He says, Wallahi by Allah, I have never regretted my animosity towards you. Basically, I have no regrets. I, I hated you and I stick by that hatred. No regrets whatever, even though I'm being taken to my death. And then he says, you know, it's an astounding phrase, but whoever Allah humiliates, that is the real one who is humiliated. And he knows deep down inside his situation that Allah has humiliated him because of his enemy towards the Prophet, uh, enmity towards the Prophet Sallam, right? And then again, in, in, in all his arrogance, he turns around, he says say this to the Prophet Sallam, and he turns around to his own people who are being led to be executed. And again, they start off, the executor would start off with the chief of the chiefs, you know? Uh, and then you work your way down to to uh, to to the the, the, the nobles and then the the, the, the commoners and that's that's the sort of the order that it's done. So it's you know uh, so the common people can see what's happened to their chiefs and there's no way out for them. And obviously, if the chiefs repent, it may then impact upon the the, the other people. But again, they're too arrogant to do that in front of their own people, right? So he turns around to his own people and says, Oh my people, don't be sad. This is the decree of Allah on Bani Israel. Right? This is what Allah has uh, determined for us people, the people of Bani Israel, the, the, the followers of Moses, yeah, that we are going to be in this situation. That's our lot in life, is basically what he's saying. And he lowered his neck and was uh, executed. And again, the, the books say, you know, make, make reference to who executed who. Uh, uh, and then uh, shortly after that, uh, or around about the same time, you know, uh, chronology is not clear, uh, Ka'ab bin Asad, again, the chief of 
Bonokainoka, he's uh, led out. And as he's passing the Prophet son, the Prophet son says, look, oh, God, right? Obviously, they know yeah, each other. Oh, God, why didn't you take benefit from the ad advice of Ibn Qarash? Right? And Ibn Qarash, and uh, is well known, was a rabbi who had specifically predicted the coming of the Prophet It's in their books. They know it. That's why they're there. Why had he taken advice, uh, 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 taken benefit from the advice of uh, Ibn Qarash, right? For he believed in me, and he commanded you to follow me, and he told you to give his salam to me through you, right? So uh, Ibn Qarash, a, a learned rabbi, knows the process of coming, and he was he's an elderly man. And he basically said, look. I'm not going to be around for, for longer, but the, the, the prophet is due imminently. Again, we know this because this is what was said to uh, Salman and Farsi. The prophet is due imminently. And when you, when you see him, give him my salam. Right? And and so, again, he's reminding them of this. And then so Qab says, look, I swear by the Torah that this is true. He knows this. And again, it's just mind-bogglingly absurd, right? He's in this situation. He knows this to be. He's seen all the signs. He even told his people, let's become Muslims because we've got no choice. He is the prophet. We know that. He goes, I swear by Allah, this is true. And were it not for the fact that the Jews would criticize me and say, because I was scared of death I converted, I would follow you, right? But I will die as a Jew. Right? This is Kaab bin Hassan. He knows the truth. Right? And, and, and he's saying a phrase similar to what Abu Talib said on his deathbed. We talked about Betty. If it weren't for the fact that my people would take the mick out of me for converting on my deathbed, uh, I'm too proud to do that. I will die on the religion of my forefathers. And he's saying the same. I don't want my people to take the mick out of me and uh, think I'm scared of dying. Uh, I will die in the religion of my forefathers as a, as a Jew, even though I know I'm wrong. Right? Even though I know I will be spared and, and all my sins will be forgiven if I become a, uh, a Muslim. And again, I, I, you know, it's just incredible how disjointed some people's priorities are and how they don't prioritize Jannah. They don't prioritize the pleasure of Allah, right? And, 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 and they are arrogant enough to follow the will of the people. And we see that in the people today, the people that we mix with, the people who are all around us, right? They don't want to prioritize the hukam of Allah, and they would rather please their friends. They would rather please you know, people uh, who get impressed by it, or who they're impressed by, you know, people who, who, who are rich or powerful or, or have the bling, they would far rather please those people than take on a bit of hardship and please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the same mentality, but this is more extreme because it's on your deathbed, right? Uh, so, uh, so uh, Hoyei is executed, Kaab bin Asad is executed, and then all the other men and uh, women are being, uh, sorry, men uh, are being executed. But there is one lady who is laughing hysterically, and Aisha, she recounts this lie. I was amazed that there's one woman who is just hysterically laughing and joking and shouting, and she's in, 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 in the camp. The, yeah, the, the other women and children, they're, 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 they're obviously very solemn. They're seeing the men folk being executed. But there's one woman who stands out, and she is just brazenly, you know, uh, joking around. And I just said, look, this is just incongruent, right? Uh, and, and then that woman hears her name called, and she stands up. And so I just says, why are you standing? And she goes, look. I'm going to be killed. And I said, this is why. She goes, well, because I did something. And she knows it. She knows she was going to be killed. Right? 
uh, and then she 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 gets uh, called and then she's uh, she's executed uh, and she knew what she'd done basically she'd killed one of the Sahabi during the siege right uh, and again it, it's uh, uh, what the uh, one of the uh, recordings is that basically she won a, a, a millstone that you use to grind uh, mill uh, to grind a uh, wheat uh, a millstone she you know dropped that on uh, one of those harbi and killed him um, and you know this was again this is similar to what Banu Nadir were going to do to the Prophet uh, when he stood up and walked away outside the wall so uh, so she was led off to be uh, killed and Aisha she she uh, she recounted like, I'm never going to be ceased to get that image out of my mind and be amazed at her laughing uh, while she's no, while she would, knew she was going to be executed, some s sort of, you know, um, you know, quasi hysteria that had, 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 had got her when she's seeing all the men folk being uh, executed, and she knows that she's going to uh, face her uh, 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 death. One, uh, one other sort of uh, final interesting uh, story. Uh, I mean, again, it's, it's it's just unbelievable. Uh, and, and that's uh, the, the story of uh, a friend of Thabit ibn al Qais. Right? So, Thabit ibn al Qais, he is an Ansari from the, no doubt, from the house. And uh, he was saved or, or uh, during, during the Battle of Bu'ad, and we talked about the Battle of Bu'ad between the house and the Khazraj, uh, which happened uh, uh, two, three years before Hijra. And, and in that battle, all of the senior leadership, virtually all of the senior leadership of the Aus and Khajraj were wiped out during that, that ongoing battle, uh, leaving only, you know, a handful of uh, senior people. Obviously, one of the most senior ones to survive was the leader of the hypocrites uh, in Salud, uh, Abdullah ibn Abay. Um, and, and then you had a, a younger crop of leaders Right, chiefs like Saad bin Mu'ad and Saad ibn Abada, right, uh, who were the generation below who who, who weren't uh, uh, wiped out in in that battle. So Thabit ibn, uh, Thabit ibn al Qais, he uh, had a favor done to him, whether his life was saved or not, probably during the Battle of Bu'ad by someone from. Uh, Someone from Banu uh, 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 This chap called was called Zubair. So uh, Zubair has been uh, 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 led out as one of the prisoners uh, to uh, uh, to be executed, uh, and then Thabit he removes his favor. So he goes and he finds Zubair, you know, and he goes, "Look, do you remember me?" And Zubair goes, yeah, "Of course, you're the person I say." And then Thabit says, like, well, then it's time for me to repay a favour. Is that all right with you? And Zubair goes, well, of course, <laughs> you know. Uh, and at, at this point in time, Zubair was an elderly gentleman, but still, uh, Zubair, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Thabit wanted to repay his favour. And he goes, okay, fine. Uh, and, and then uh, Thabit uh, goes to the Prophet and says, look, brings uh, Zubair and says, look, Ya Rasulullah, please allow... Zubair to be spared, right? He may have explained the situation, but he just basically let him off. Don't execute him. Prophet says, okay, fine. It's a reasonable request from uh, a respected Sahabi. Okay. And he agreed. So, the, uh, Zubair is let off. He's not executed. His life is spared. So, uh, Thabi goes back and says, look, the Prophet says, agree. He can live. And then Zubair goes, he's hedging his bets. He's... he's pushing the bow tie. He goes, what use is a life without family? So the Prophet uh, so uh, Thabit then goes back uh, to the Prophet and goes, look, can you spare his, his family and his children? And uh, the Prophet says, okay, fine. They're for your two. So they are uh, two for you, basically. Um, you can have uh, Zubair, you can have his, his family, his wife and his children, and the property that's safe. Uh, well, not the Prophet comes the next one. Uh, so Thabit goes back, uh, and, and the Prophet agrees, uh, and then uh, he, uh, Thabit goes back to Zubair, and Zubair goes, well, what use is life without money? 
also uh, he wants not just his family, he wants his money back as well. As, so, so uh, Fabian obviously is feeling a bit embarrassed, but you know he has to follow through. And he goes back to Rosalind and says, "Well, what about? Can he have his property and money and everything?" And Fabian goes, "Yeah, for you as well." And then, uh, so Zubair has spared his life, his family, and he's got his money and his property and his wealth house back, and he hasn't needed to change his religion. So then Zubair goes, well, where's so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so, you know, probably, you know, naming some of the elders, you know, where's the chief, where's Bab, where's Hoye, where's so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so -and -so? And so some of the greats in their elite. Uh, and again, you know, so they start off with the elites and they work their way down. Uh, and, and, and then listing, you know, his other friends. And they've all been killed, right? So then Zubair turns around and says, what is life without my friends and my tribe? Send me to my death. And he's, out, he's, he's elderly. And so he basically agreed to be executed, even though he was given a stay of execution. He said, look, there's no point in living, right, uh, without my friends. Uh, you know, what's the point in it, right? Uh, even if I'm keeping my, my, my family, my wealth, who am I going to share my joy with I'm going to be friendless uh, send me to my death and then uh, reluctantly again you know he was taken uh, and, 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 and he was uh, killed um, now it's recorded that some of the uh, Banu uh, Fureva they became Muslim they converted to Islam and so they were spared not only were they spared they could keep their, you know, their, their family, they could keep their wealth, they could keep their possessions, their houses, right? And again, this goes on to show, and we'll probably talk about this next week, this goes to show the, the fact that the this hook, this is nothing to do with anti-Semitism, this is nothing to do with the process of having a personal vendetta against uh, Bani uh, Israel or the Jewish people, nothing to do with that. It's because of their treachery. They become Muslim, that's fine. All is forgiven. It's nothing to do with their race, nothing to do with who they are. It's what they did, right? Uh, so, so some of Banu Qurayza, uh, they converted and they were spared. And again, we we, we, we knew of the, the, the story of the, the man who'd left the night before the executions, right? And the Prophet didn't send out a search party to, because uh, he spent the night in Medina, he didn't send out a search party to bring him back to be executed. No, let him go. Um, uh, and again, you know, uh, uh, those who, you know, converted to Islam, that's fine. And again, this, this goes to show this is not about who they are. It's not about, you know, because uh, they've got rid of uh, Banu Hainuka, they've got rid of Banu Nadir, and now they're getting rid of Banu Nadir, and they, they, he's got a personal vendetta against the, these people because they're different. No, become a Muslim, everything is forgiven. Start from scratch. Uh, so... Uh, so some people had uh, become Muslim, uh, and uh, we'll uh, talk last couple of minutes. Then we'll we'll we'll, we'll finish off with the, the distribution of the booty, uh, the, uh, the 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 It said that the number of men fighting men who were killed were about between six and seven hundred, uh, there or thereabouts. Some. Some estimates are as low as 400, some estimates are as high as about 900. Uh, and then again, if you do the multiplier, you know, of 2.5, you can see, you know, in terms of uh, men, uh, sorry, men and women and children. So it's it's taken so in, in those societies, the multiplier about 2.5. So for every man, there'll be 2.5 others in terms of women and children. Uh, you can see how big uh, Banu uh, Qureyza uh, uh, was, but Allah knows best, uh, you know, about six, seven, uh, six to seven hundred of them. Uh, and there was a lot of booty, obviously, the whole tribe, and they were a rich tribe, right? Fifteen hundred swords, uh, uh, fifteen hundred shields, and going with the swords, they were uh, um, gathered as part of the booty. Uh, and. 2,000 spears, 300 full body suits, armor, full body armor suits, uh, thousands of camel and sheep, against the whole tribe. You know, they lived in their fortress, right? 
uh, and again, these 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 were all taken as 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 booty. Lots of alcohol, obviously, because alcohol was allowed for the non-Muslims. Uh, that was all uh, destroyed. Uh, and uh, you know uh, the rules of Ghanima were followed in, in, in terms of and uh, we talked about this before that uh, someone who even those laying siege uh, those who were uh, cavalry right who had a horse uh, were uh, given uh, three shares compared to the, the infantry just the ordinary soldier right uh, who gets the the one share, right? And these are volunteer. This is a volunteer army. It's not fully professional paid upon. These are volunteer army. So you, you know, you you have a horse. You need to feed the horse. You need to look after the horse, right? Uh, and you know, it incurs more expenses. So possibly because of that, the rulings are that you get, you know, uh, they get uh, the uh, cavalry get three shares. You know, uh, uh, you know, one or two for the horse and one for them. Right, uh, so you know, one share for the animal essentially, and you know, two for the the, uh, the cavalry. Because again, their skill level is slightly high. They're not just ordinary, you know, foot soldiers. To be a knight, have a horse, you you need to be trained, and, and it's a different skill set. You need to be more specialist in your fighting and acumen. So they 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 get uh, two shares for them, one for the horse. The infantry, the normal soldiers get uh, get the one share. One fifth, I think we talked about this before, is given to the Prophet Salam and to the uh, Beit al Mal, the Islamic State, the the Treasury. Okay, um, and <clears throat> then the final story, which we'll talk about here, just uh, touch upon it, is that amongst uh, the Ghanima. Uh, when they're distributing the, uh, the spoils, you've got uh, Rehana. Uh, she was given to the Farsa Salam and he invited her to Islam, uh, but she refused. Again, she's from uh, the, uh, the, the, the Jewish tribe. She wanted to stay uh, in her own religion. The invited her to become a Muslim, and, but she refused. But she's, you know, uh, in Prophet Salam's uh, uh, entourage. Uh, so, Prophet Salam decided that basically she's not interested in becoming a muslim uh, so he wanted to transfer her ownership and you know give her to someone else because he obviously doesn't want anyone in his entourage who's not uh, a strong muslim uh, so uh, but then she's she's panicking a bit what should i do so the Prophet gave her time to do this is obviously later on gave her time to decide you know you know the rules you can stay with me become a muslim uh, if you're not then you know uh, you can stay to your own religion and you know go go with someone else and then it said that when she realized the Prophet was going to leave her some say that she became a Muslim right uh, so she would rather you know be with the Prophet uh, because of his sort of care and gentleness and, and, and the way he treats uh, the ladies you know um, and uh, so then the Prophet um, some the report are that she converted and the Prophet gave her the option to free her and then marry her. Right? Again, there's a, there, there, there's, uh, there's different narrations about what happened with Rehana. Later on, some uh, narrations say that she didn't want to be a wife. She would rather be in servitude. Others say that she did. Uh, but but either way, you know, it's it's you know there, there is this sort of you know uh, a grey area around uh, the uh, the fate of not fate but what happened with uh, Rehana but anyway that's that's the sort of the other thing with regards to the distribution of the Khanima so we'll finish there inshallah uh, next time we'll talk about two issues inshallah one is to uh, talk about this uh, charge that some people have especially nowadays or certainly in the last 100 150 years since the rise of Orientalism where people charge the Prophet with anti-Semitism uh, and they use this ex episode of the execution of Manu uh, Ainoka uh, to show that his hatred for the Jews but it's obviously nothing to do with that so we'll talk about that in a slightly more detail um, and then we'll also talk about going back to the beginning the, the, the issue of ikhtilaf and uh, differences of opinion where the Prophet says 
do not pray asal until you get to Bonin Koreda, which is a really important, uh, thick, uh, jurisprudent uh, issue that I, I think is important to, 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 to talk about in relation to this uh, specific episode. Uh, and again, hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll sit in people's uh, minds as it has done with mine when I you know, came across this over 30 years ago. Really important uh, issue. Do not pray as soon as you get to one for either. Inshallah. So I'll finish there. It's nearly uh, Maghrib, uh, literally a couple of minutes to go. Uh, so uh, finally to say, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for coming to the end of the video. Uh, session 128. Uh, alhamdulillah, you know, it's remarkable Allah has given uh, me the ability to, to, to get this far in the seed in, in, in the way that we have. And for those two or three people who are listening and persevering, thank you. Really uh, means a lot to me uh, and allows me, and again, I said this before, to, to, to re engage with the seed and, and the love of the Prophet and, and get closer to, to the whole. You know uh, the, the history of, of who the Prophet was and, and, and how we should uh, relate to him, and it makes the stories more alive for me. So thank you for that. Um, so do you remember uh, the Ummah in your du'as? Do you remember me in your du'as? Uh, and uh, hopefully you get some benefit uh, from this. Uh, so uh, until next time, if you do have any questions, queries, comments, uh, suggestions, you know, put them on YouTube, uh, WhatsApp. The uh, Facebook page or the, 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 the blog, and inshallah, you know, I'll uh, address them. So take care. This is Mark Rahim. Well, as in no insan, I love you, Hassan Illa Ladina, and the Mamma Swahili Haki Badawa, so Bill Haki Badawa, so be sober. Jazakallah, everybody, and Sankum.